Uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Byrne is board certified in pediatric and neonatal and prenatal medicine. He is an international lecturer on medical ethics and a staunch opponent of abortion and euthanasia. Uh, past president of, of the Catholic Medical Association and a member of the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars, Dr. Byrne has made presentations on life issues to state legislatures in the United States. He is also the chairman of the Ethics Committee, uh, the City of Faith Medical and Research Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma and has addressed uh, today the Fatima Conference, the Path to Peace Conference on the subject of brain death. Welcome, Dr. Byrne. Thank you. I was the chairman of the Ethics Committee when I was on that faculty. I see. But I'm not there anymore. Uh, fair but, enough. But um, anyway. Now, Dr. Byrne, in, in television show after television show that deals with medical issues, uh, when, the, when doctors want to make a determination of whether someone is dead, they look at some sort of scan of the brain and they say, that the, you know, you see the sort of line that sort of flicks up and down and then it sort of goes, uh, it goes into a straight horizontal line and the person is declared dead. And you say there's a, there's a problem with that, uh, that approach to the issue of death. What is the problem? Well, the first thing is they're not required to do that scan. They can declare someone brain dead without doing any sophisticated testing. It was uh, uh, a, a, what they call a clinical diagnosis, a bedside diagnosis. And, and uh, it was done in somebody who was in a coma, uh, unresponsive, and uh, shine a light in the eye and see no response from the pupil. Uh, touch cotton to the eye, get no response. They put ice water in the ear and no response. And no, count, no cough and no gag and on a ventilator. And, and it was uh, a clinical diagnosis. Uh, and, and, um, and the thing that you're talking about, the recording of, of uh, brain waves, that was one of the things that I paid attention to when I first uh, started to uh, study this subject is that in those that they did do brainwave testing and they had flat brainwaves, I found one man uh, in the literature who was without brainwaves for 39 days and then made complete recovery. And so I knew there was something wrong with that. <clears throat> they all knew there was something wrong with it from the beginning too. Uh, and so there was no requirement, uh, absolute requirement, to do brainwave testing at any time. But uh, where you would think that it would be the more sophisticated kind of testing in making this uh, uh, declaration of, uh, of brain death, uh, uh, in fact, it's not very sophisticated. It's primarily at the bedside. And even when they do sophisticated testing, like one of the uh, uh, scenarios that I showed at the conference was uh, that of Zach Dunlap from uh, Oklahoma who had what uh, has been declared to be the ultimate in testing, the gold standard they'd like to make it, the technetium scan of the head uh, uh, and showed he had no circulation to his uh, brain. Uh, and, and not only did they do the test once, they did it twice. No circulation to his brain. And, and uh, uh, how did he survive? Uh, uh, the organ transplanters uh, were uh, landing in the helicopter. His death notice had already been published in the newspaper. So how did he survive? He survived because he had a relative who was a nurse, and the nurse did another test and saw some kind of response. And then he said, whoa, and stopped everything so far as taking his organs. There are no survivors after their beating heart is cut out. Uh, what happens with the declaration of brain death, it's the action that follows that makes them become dead, not the fact uh, that the brain isn't functioning. In fact, the matter is, uh, a a as it goes, if you think about it, the brain can be not functioning uh, and, and uh, we can live for a very long time, uh, as evidenced by uh, Alan Schumann has collected 175 long-term survivors of brain death. Uh, I, I uh, uh, have a, a person who lives very close to me uh, who was injured on a motorcycle and uh, declared brain dead and uh, relatives were to go in and say goodbye and, uh, uh, and his wife read things that I wrote because she 
duplicated them uh, uh, where I would take them to be duplicated. She'd say, may I keep one? And so she kept it and read it and, and she said, give him a little more time. And then after two days, they said, well, we want to do another test just to prove that he's brain dead. And she said, you mean for two days you've been telling me he's brain dead and now you want to do another test to prove it? No. So when I go there, he still has some trouble with walking, but he shakes my hand and has conversation with me. So that's a local one. Uh, 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 the, the little boy in, in uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska was declared brain dead uh, at the age of four. And, and, uh, and so I had the privilege of taking care of him part of the time. I was not his main doctor, I was just a consultant and I covered when the doctor was out of town. But he lived 20 years after the diagnosis of brain death. Uh, uh, was there any question about his brain being destroyed? It cannot be any more destroyed than what it was. He, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his brain swelled so much that his skull bones blew apart and the brain protruded between the, the soft places that are there in little babies' brains. Uh, his brain, his skull exploded at the age of, of four and the brain protruded through that. I mean, you can't have it anymore. And he lived 20 years. And of course, uh, 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 when I uh, presented this at a uh, very prominent uh, 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 organization, uh, uh, one of the people in the audience said, uh, or heard me said, well, I would have just turned off his ventilator. And I thought to myself, because I was a polite person, I thought to myself, over his mother's dead body, you would have turned off his ventilator because, uh, uh, as, as she said, of course I'd rather he be riding his tricycle. She says, but I love him, so I accept him like he is. I, I, I wish he were different than this, but I accept him. That's what love is, and God loves us, and, and God gives us our life, and he loves us. Even when we don't behave like we should, uh, there's a mechanism that we can get back in the good graces of God, and and uh, that's called confession. Uh, and and uh, uh, and he set it up so that we can do that. He loves us all the time. And but you know something? That's what mothers do to children. They love their children all the time. Uh, we have uh, 12 children, and it seemed to me, no matter what. Uh, our children were doing and most of the time it was sons who uh, did different things <laughs> and, uh, and she would always be on the side of our children and I would say well it's 13 against one again <laughs> and, and I'd say but that just makes the odds even <laughs> and, but the, God loves us we love our children and, and uh, God uh, uh, sets it up so that we can care about each other. And as a, a, a physician, uh, we have gifts and talents from God. That's where they come from. And then we study and learn to be a doctor. And then our obligation is to protect and preserve the life of our patient. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, uh, that, that means that, that uh, patients who are in coma, patients who are uh, unresponsive, and all of my patients are like that when they're little babies. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, tube feedings and they use uh, feedings for adults, like that's awful. Every one of my premature babies were tube fed. Uh, and so, and so, so I'm used to that. So, so people that are unable to protect themselves, they're vulnerable. Uh, and and uh, people who are in coma are, are vulnerable to what happens. And we live in a society uh, where organ transplantation is big business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. It's bigger than the abortion business. And and they need resources to operate their business. Business, and their resources are healthy organs. And where do you get healthy organs? You get them from living persons. Can you get a healthy organ from a cadaver? No, you can't. 
Uh, there are no healthy organs you can take from a cadaver and do anything with them. In the beginning, they tried it, you know, and, but it didn't work, uh, either not at all or not very well. And, and so, so uh, uh, brain death is not true death. Organ transplantation, no one should be participating in organ transplantation. And if you want to read more about this, you can read uh, my writings at uh, the three W's, lifeguardianfoundation.org, and you can get uh, a, an opt-out card there, and you can also get these, these booklets there. And we have another booklet uh, called, Is Brain Death True Death? And you, you can uh, get that. And uh, so I encourage uh, the, uh, the people who see this to contact www.lifeguardianfoundation.org. Now, when people are uh, often talking about death, they uh, or doctors are talking about death, they, the sort of the typical thing that you'll hear is the machines are keeping him or her alive, and that but for the machines they would be dead. And so, essentially, I think the the common perception is that the pe the people are already dead, and the machines are basically sort of preserving uh, what's left of their life. And and uh, you know, if the, once the machines stop, their lives come to an end. Is that a, a correct understanding that the, the well, common person? Uh, uh, first of all, if, you, uh, if we don't use the correct language, then we have no chance of communicating. And the idea that the machines are keeping somebody alive is a misconception in itself. Uh, and then the machines, the, uh, there, uh, uh, there are a number of pieces of equipment that we use, but the main one is the ventilator. And the ventilator moves air into somebody who can't breathe on their own. But it doesn't move the air out. It's only the living person who pushes the air out. So, and the ventilator just moves the air. It doesn't cause respiration. Some people call it a respirator, but it's not a respirator. It's a ventilator that moves the air in, and it works if you have a living person. And that living person must have circulation, uh, and the circulation to the lungs and the circulation to the rest of the body. And the other equipment that's used is primarily that we use them to sense things that help us to do a better job. But it's only the ventilator. So far as keeping them alive, only God keeps any of us alive. Uh, that what the ventilator does is supports the vital activity of movement of air, which in turn supports the vital activity of respiration and circulation. But that's all that it does. So you see the ventilator as a, as a reasonable means of preserving life, much like uh, providing uh, hydration or nutrition to someone uh, by way of a tube. Is, in, is the ventilator similar to that? In, in many ways, it, it's not any different. Okay, because uh, w w isn't there often times in, in these in these sort of hospital settings pressure uh, to get off the ventilator to, to sort of see if the if the patient can continue to breathe on his or her own, and if they, if they can't, then that's pretty much sort of taken as a sign that the uh, person is on on their way out. Well, they they do what's called an apnea test, and they take away the ventilator in people who are brain injured. They take it away for ten minutes. Uh, they suffocate them for 10 minutes. Uh, they, uh, uh, they must prove that they can breathe on their own, or that's a signal to get their beating heart and other organs cut out. So are you saying breathing on your own is not a, a sort of, a, 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 sort of a, a necessity for being considered uh, alive? You're still alive even if you cannot breathe on your own? Well, uh, a good example would be Christopher Reeves. You remember Christopher Reeves, sure. who was the actor who played Superman, fell off his horse. And then for years after he fell off his horse, we saw him on the television. He was on a ventilator all the time okay. during that time. The uh, ventilator is the kind of thing that helps people. Uh, and and uh, uh, they, uh, the ventilators are so sophisticated now. They're so nice. We can dial in a very sophisticated way of helping people to breathe. And, and uh, people say, oh, they don't want to ever be on a ventilator. They should not ever be saying that because a ventilator is a kind of thing that can help people. Many times we use the ventilator for just a short time, a day or two, and it helps them get over things and they go on and live a normal life. Sometimes, depending on what it is, they need the ventilator for a longer period of time. But ventilators, as Christopher Reeves was on the stage with the ventilator all the time, no one saw his ventilator. It was under his wheelchair. Okay. Uh, uh, but he 
he couldn't take a breath on his own uh, after he fell off his horse. But if, if you had a patient who was, say, non-responsive, who was in a coma, say, for, for years and years, and they were able to survive on, on, with tube nutrition and, and hydration and a ventilator, in your judgment, they are still alive and they ought to be preserved in that state, uh, maintained in that state by the medical community. Well, their life can be protected and preserved, but similar to that is that one of my, my good friends is not on a ventilator, uh, but she's on a feeding tube and has a urinary catheter, and she's been like that for 10 years. And I uh, go to see her husband uh, to, because uh, he takes care of her day and night. And when I uh, went to see her just last week, I said, hello, Laura, it's Paul. And she opened her eyes. Okay, so I said, Laura, is it all right if I pray? And then I said, the Our Father. And I said, the Our Father, who art in heaven. And then she began to lip the words. Wow. I saw her lip the word. She's been bedridden for 10 years. Now, who would want to kill her? Mm. I mean, uh, just because you can't do something doesn't mean you're less of a person. Uh, a person is created in the image and likeness of God. And what, what we uh, must do is protect and preserve the life. And we must not kill them. And we must not make them weaker. And, and why do they want people to become dead because they cost money and and uh, and and but they really don't cost much money uh, 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 Laura gets her feedings in little cans every six hours she gets a little can uh, of, of uh, it's a milk product and, and you add water to it that's all it's not expensive at all in some ways even less expensive than uh, uh, a person who would be walking around and, and moving uh, oh much less expensive to feed her than it is to feed her husband or to feed me right uh, and, and and so it's, it's not a matter of that and 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 of course she does have a husband and he dearly loves her uh, and, uh, and takes care of her. Uh, so it, uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, understanding where life comes from, understanding that, that we are creatures, which means we are created. And we are creatures, the special creatures made in the image and likeness of God. And so uh, we are not like beasts. The beasts are reproduced. You, uh, uh, but every person is a new person, a new creation by God. And God picks out our mother. We should thank God for our mother and father and because they weren't chosen by us. They were chosen by God. And God knew exactly what he was doing. I have so many examples of just special parents who take care of their children with special uh, uh, problems. And, and, uh, and so, so uh, these are relatively simple things, but you've got to go back to the basics. Uh, you've got to know that we live in a very, uh, uh, where medicine is very sophisticated for imaging, but medicine is not so very sophisticated for taking care of persons. And, and, uh, and sometimes when you take care of a person, uh, you do it in, in a way that, that you do the best you can, but you know that no one lives on earth forever. Uh, uh, but just because we don't live on earth forever doesn't mean that we should do something to shorten our life. Dr. Burns, in our last segment, I want to uh, touch on the a topic of what uh, the average person should do when confronted with one of these issues uh, in the hospital of the death or the, or the sickness, the uh, affliction of uh, one of their loved ones. But before getting to that, I just want to touch on, uh, you, you, you've mentioned God and, and, and the faith several times. Uh, a few years ago, if memory serves, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, the Vatican, uh, some institute in the Vatican seemed to issue a document that may have given some credence to the fact that the church uh, seemed to be accepting this notion of brain death. Do you, re do you recall that at all? And if, if, what is your understanding of the, of the church's teaching on this issue of, of death? Well, the first thing is, uh, everybody who lives in the Vatican is not the church. And, and uh, they, uh, if you talk about the magisterium of the, of the church, uh, it would be the Pope. 
is the magisterium of the church, and he's the final answer. Uh, uh, there is another part of the church called the sacred congregation of the doctrine of the faith, and that's to protect the doctrine of the faith. So if if they spoke on it, but but uh, the only things that the uh, uh, the popes have said uh, is primarily to uh, uh, to protect and preserve the life, uh, and and uh, and they spell out. Uh, as popes do, what does death mean? Death means decomposition, Pope John Paul II said. Uh, Pope Benedict the uh, uh, taught uh, that that um, um, individual vital organs cannot be extracted except ex cadavere, and he put the ex cadavere in the Latin, which means uh, from a cadaver uh, to uh, to use that close translation, but from a dead body. Okay. So uh, he knew that that uh, what to say, and he said it. The question is, do we want to follow it? I say, do we? I want to follow it. His teaching is quite clear, uh, uh, and uh, he also said that that you could not take these uh, organs from the he called them donator from the donor, except after his or her true death, and true death in the Latin is mors vera. Uh, and so true death means the separation of the soul from the body. Uh, and so there are a lot of people that would like for things to uh, happen whatever way they wish it to happen, but the teachings of the church uh, are clear. You cannot kill somebody. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, you, you cannot do something to make somebody to harm somebody to make them weaker you can't do that so the teachings are clear the question is do we want to follow the teachings or uh, there are some people uh, some organizations that will even have Catholic in their name uh, but they say some things that are clearly different from what I say and if you if you want to uh, uh, read about it you can get this book uh, from uh, www.lifeguardianfoundation.org and uh, in there uh, we do have a section on Catholic teaching on death and organ transplantation and it quotes the catechism, quotes the councils of the church, uh, which are official teachings, uh, quotes Pope Pius XII, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and these are the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the teachings so far as uh, life and death are concerned can never change. The Catholic Church can never say it's all right to kill an innocent person. Uh, if they do, they won't be the Catholic Church. Uh, Dr. Burns, I want to spend our remaining minutes just to, to focus on very practical issues. Someone is, uh, your loved one is in the hospital, he or she is in a coma. You want to live this, this life ethic. You don't want to have anything happen to him or her uh, before they actually uh, have uh, gone through true death. Yes. And what, what are the practical steps that someone ought to take in that circumstance? The first thing is that you need to prepare ahead of time in this culture of death that we live, you must prepare ahead of time. That is, you need documents in place to protect your life, your spouse's life, your children's life if they go off to grandma's house or to camp. And in this booklet, there are documents that will help you to to do that. So these uh, are documents you would hold on your person then? You hold them on your person uh, uh, and the, the little cards you get, you carry them on your person, but the other cards you keep them someplace where it's safe, but you make it clear that you want to be treated. You want your life to be protected and preserved. That's the first thing. And you don't want them to, to do anything that's going to harm you. The apnea test is done in people with head injuries, and no one should have an apnea test. The apnea test suffocates the patient, so you need to know this. And, and uh, the first thing to do is pray a lot. Uh, but also you should prepare, get these things in place. You must have them in place and get them from us now. These little cards are called opt-out cards. Uh, everybody needs them, you need to carry them. Uh, and the opt-out card isn't simply to stop organ donation uh, or the taking of organs. The opt-out card is to protect and preserve your life and get treatment for yourself uh, because everything is set up when you are vulnerable and very sick not to treat you anymore. So you have to prepare ahead of time in the hospital 
I want my, my, my spouse, my son, my daughter to have their life protected and preserved and, and the question is whatever treatment it is that there's a question about you, ask the question, will it protect and preserve the life and if it will, do it and if it won't, don't do it. What about these do not resuscitate orders? What would you say about, about those? Yeah, no one should have a do not resuscitate order. The do not resuscitate order, uh, and they, they are all part of advanced directives like living wills. There's nothing living about living wills. Uh, no one should have a living will, uh, is what I would say, uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like life insurance. Life insurance has nothing to do with life. It has to do with death. Living, living wills have nothing to do with living. They have to do with making you dead sooner uh, and getting less treatment for you. The other kind of advanced directive is a power of attorney. And yes, you do need a power of attorney which designates someone to speak for you because in some states, if you don't have that, they will appoint someone to speak for you. The court will. So you have to have a power of attorney, but the power of attorney should only be able to protect and preserve your life, not use like under appropriate conditions or when uh, death is imminent that they can take away your treatment. No, 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 no. And every power of attorney that I've seen, except the one that we send to you, has it set up that under certain conditions, somebody can kill you. Uh, and that's no good. You need uh, protect and preserve life uh, is what you need to do. And, and uh, when somebody goes in the hospital, pray a lot and make it clear you want them to be treated. So uh, if people want more information, they want to get a copy of this book, uh, your literature, this card, how can they contact you? How contact us at www.lifeguardianfoundation.org, www.lifeguardianfoundation.org. Thank you very much, Dr. Burns, for Thank all the you. work you've done. Our Lady said, if my requests are not heeded, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions against the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. <laughs>